Hi, my name is Benedict. This uh, is about revoicing and about a particular piece. I have no specific plan. I just thought I'm going to do this. Uh, for those of you who follow me assiduously, uh, you probably would know that I made a piece for uh, Reason Studios Object Challenge, what have you. Uh, I wasn't going to initially, and I thought, eh, what the? It gives me a reason to use it in battle. And I enjoyed it because I think that Object is a really, really well designed synth. I think it's everything that Reason does well. But my thinking from the beginning was I'm not sure this is a Benedict synth. Uh, there's just something about the sound that doesn't sit well for me. And it's not the sound of object, it's the sound of physical modelling that doesn't entirely sit well with me. It can be striking, it can be dramatic, it can be amazing, but it doesn't feel like me. Uh, and so I made this piece also wanting to see, well, how does that come out? And I liked the piece, I still like the piece, but bearing in mind there's a, a, an album's worth of other material that's sitting around it, I don't feel like it fits in. In which case, the increasing thought was, well, is it just the wrong output levels or is it just kind of the wrong sounds? Uh, so I thought, look, why don't I revoice this? So here's some of the original. But I'll just keep going backwards and forwards. You can see one being the original, two being the revoice. So same exactly. And to a great extent, I have kept the same mix settings as much as is reasonable. Uh, same mastering settings, although they are a little different um, because I've used some of my regular contenders, uh, although that's not a regular one for me. But I tried to keep a lot of things equal because I felt no need to change them. So here's uh, some of the original. New voice. And before you say, oh, but they're not the same sound at all. Yeah, it's a revoice. So I'm allowing myself to, to go in different directions to do what each synth is strong at doing. Uh, and I like the fluty sound that I got. I'm open to the happy accidents of things leading where they lead. I, I'm a big believer of following the song gods rather than saying, I've made lots of videos about that and a couple recently very strongly around that. Let's go back. Next sound that comes in. Now, I really liked neither of these individual sounds on their own. I mean, I liked them because I used them. But once you put the two together here, they just created this wonderful sort of cello sound, which obviously I wasn't really able to duplicate. But I ended up with a different result that still feels nice. Ultimately, it's always about the overall with me. I'm always sitting back going, what's the overall here? Do the details fit? But the details to me are never as important as the overall, hence my ability to revoice quite easily. Back to the first one, new section. Obviously the new string is quite different, but objects and string sounds, you know, syrupy Mozart kind of strings, they're not the most balanced pair. Next section. Now this sound here, that funny, I really liked. So I couldn't duplicate that exactly, or at least I, d I didn't have an easy thought on how to duplicate some of that exactly, because that was using uh, noise, so like speckly noise, to keep re-triggering some of the, the physical model. Uh, so just a slightly different approach. We 
still have that same fundamental of something that's a little like a mandolin being plucky, plucky, plucky as you do. Next bit, original. Trumpet voice. Really nice DX style analog synth brass happening there. Next section. Now you could possibly say, and I'm happy enough to accept that, that the new version may have a more old-fashioned, syrupy, movie kind of a sound to it. Uh, I had no particular aims with regards to the original one, how it was supposed to sound, because I was following where object took me. We did end up with quite an Asian-y kind of sound, and some of that is because the scale at the beginning is a mutation of something vaguely like a pentatonic. Uh, there's a particular note in the key scale that is avoided. Uh, and then as we move towards the end, then it actually all restates with a more conventional C major. <laughs> Most people are not going to notice that at all, but it does mean that we have slightly less of that Asian feel. Plus, this is, of course, a lot less like Koto's. Original. New voicing. So overall, I think I'm happy. I haven't checked this. This is just literally just done. I thought, oh, well, I'll do this. Whilst I was doing it, probably three quarters of the way through, it suddenly dawned on me, I'm not really aware of anybody else who does revoicing. Uh, I'm aware that there are people who will recreate sounds. Uh, there's a fellow who is or was in Brisbane, who, um, Ken, I think his name is, who, uh, from Tycho Bray, uh, who did um, making of voices, remaking of voices for uh, Peter Hook, Hookie's um, band. So he went through and remade, made new versions of uh, voices from Joy Division New Order songs for, for Hookie's solo tour. Um, that's not really revoicing. Revoicing being where you take an existing piece of music, whether you're all your own or someone else's, and you apply a new set of sounds to it without hacking it up. It's not a remix. It's not a hack and slash. It's a, it's a case of saying, OK, I've got this music and I'm going to give it new voices, whether because once you get it here, you have no voices in it, like a MIDI file that you download off the Internet. I did it with um, the Eagles Hotel California. I also did it with, uh, with a collection of Bach pieces. And I did a little bit of it with the Dwight Yoakam piece. It was a shame the rest of the MIDI file wasn't there because I was having fun. Why don't other people revoice? I do it quite a lot, and I just mentioned that to my partner Jane. She was like, what, isn't that common? Because she's aware of me doing it all the time. She's been playing with some songs, and it's quite common that I just come along and go, okay, let's change that voice. Um, either because she's had to move from one door to another, because they're not as easy as people like to say they are. Um, and so I just pick up the voices and make sure that they fit for her. Um, plus, she's aware of all these times where I've voiced somebody else's work or I revoice my own or of course where I'm dealing with uh, student clients who uh, get given this revoicing task um, and often seem to really struggle to do that. So the reasons that I figured maybe that people don't do this revoicing is is a couple. 
One is that I think that people might get so tied up in the idea that there's only one version of their piece. There's only the song. And, um... Well, I kind of get that. I probably would have thought more that way when I was younger. To me, it kind of makes little sense in that the song itself is, um, as, um, 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 what's his name from Kush Audio, Gregory Scott, just said, you know, the song itself is a concept. It's a nebulous thing. That's the, the core, the idea of the song. Uh, we could take any song that's famous, not famous, what have you. We could cover it and... To, to something else. Uh, of course, a, a pretty dramatic example of that, in a sense, is Judas Priest's cover of a, of a hippie song, a Joan Baez sort of hippie song, Diamonds and Rust, and they turn it into a, well, a slightly heavy blues. It's, it's not fair to say entirely that it's heavy metal because it doesn't sound like screaming for vengeance, but they took it somewhere else. There are lots of times where that has happened, and very successfully. Why is it with all the ease of our door that we don't see lots of people doing that? Okay, cover versions are a little tricky to put on YouTube because YouTube might ping them. I couldn't put Hotel California on YouTube because it got pinged instantly. Uh, Facebook didn't ping it, so it lives there, but that doesn't have the same visibility as of being on YouTube. Fair enough. No argument one way or another. It is the choices that... Don Henley and his buddies have made their right, their song. But I think that's a small, if not kind of a nothing reason. I think we see less and less of this because, as I say, people think that their pieces, their own pieces, their own songs, what have you, have one definitive version and they couldn't possibly have other versions, which is worrying. Are you that fearful that your piece could only exist and only work and only be consistent and coherent if it was done one way. That, that kind of worries me. Uh, I'm quite open to take my pieces and just redo them. Uh, and equally open to take other pieces and just redo them. I offered it as a, uh, as a job, a, a dirt cheap intro level job as, as you know, a light-hearted thing on Facebook and Upwork for, you know, for a few peanuts. I would take any song as long as you could provide it to me in MIDI, I would turn it into a chip tune kind of thing, without being chip tune. I'd just turn it into simplistic, this kind of sound. Uh, and the only interest I ever got was from competitors trying to get me to do the job that they clearly couldn't do for half the price that they were offering it for, which was just like, yeah, piss off with that. You've set yourself up to do a job that you can't even do, and now you're needing to use somebody else to do it for you. I mean, there's something horribly wrong with the professionalism of that one. The other thing that dawned on me too was that perhaps people don't do it because they use so many loops and they can't foresee being able to have that piece exist without that loop, that that, that loop is that piece. And I've done that a little bit, not made pieces with loops, but where I have used loops in things that I've revoiced, I've just used a different loop. It just never bothered me that, or well, that's the only way that piece could exist. So it's the same sort of mindset. Uh, the same with presets. Uh, and I think there's a lot of that in Dorville, that people are not learning to use their tools, which is kind of a shame. Uh, I see a resistance in learning to use tools. There's a, like, very top-down approach. I see that in my daughters, you know, that um, it's their job to clean the cat litter when they're here. Uh, and there's the little trowel for picking up the litter, and um, I sort of keep rearranging how I use that trowel thingy in my hand to best suit the current situation. But I notice that one or both of them, they kind of put it in their hand, and then they it's like they've got no way of having this concept of reapproaching or changing how they hold the tool. It's like it's held one way and there could only be one way to do it. And so they'll be struggling and taking a lot more time where I'm sort of saying, hey, look, you know, you can, you have a wrist, it rotates fully, you can, you know, you, you can be versatile here. And I think that there's this great thing where people aren't taking the time to learn their tools to be able to turn them to different things. So if you're watching this and, and not throwing garbage at your screen, hoping that it's going to hit me in the face. 
then why not actually spend some time re-voicing? So either take some existing pieces of yours, either current-ish or older pieces, and say, okay, I'm going to delete all the voices. Maybe delete everything except the MIDI. You know, go into Reason and just go File, Export, where is it there? Export MIDI file, Import MIDI file. You'll end up with a whole lot of new tracks and they'll all be assigned ID8s with pianos. <laughs> Mute them all and then go through, open them up one after another. I prefer to do that at the, um, at the mixer. So I would simply run through and set everything to mute, except the first one, have a sound that seems to work. Brilliant. Unmute the next one, sound that seems to work with it. Brilliant. Keep moving on. And you'll very quickly find that, oh, that's interesting. Oh, that feels different. Just as we've got in here, Clearly the same piece, but different feel, especially once we get into the, with the strings. And the big, bright, floaty, shimmery sort of a feel. And there's so much you learn from doing that. And even better if you go online and download some songs. Not songs from last week, because chances are the MIDI's wrong or impossible, uh, but let's say classic songs, as I took, um, I've done uh, these revoiced covers of Bach, as I've said, I can't get much more classic than that, uh, A Flock of Seagulls I Ran, that was, that was a lot of fun doing that project, I realised an awful lot doing that, Eagles Hotel California, obviously quite a challenge because we expect it to be with a proper band, and here I am using do, 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 do kind of synth sounds and I didn't go out of my way to try to use samples or anything like that because it was just going to sound terrible so I was like, I'm going to use pure simple synth sounds and I'm really pleased with the results some people go but it doesn't sound that but that's their problem you know in terms of the song still standing up as far as I'm concerned it does it's charming it's a little funny but it doesn't make it offensive to the song itself so find things like that. I've done a Cinderella song. I didn't complete it and go any further. There were too many problems with the MIDI file. Um, I actually started to look at a Demis Roussos song. Um, I can't remember why I didn't go any further with that one, because uh, that, that could have been rather cool to do. Uh, but do that. Bring it in. You'll be a little like, uh, to start with. And then just start with blank synthesizers, not presets. Because as soon as you start with presets, you're sunk. Start with simple sounds and then build them up. So to give you a sense, obviously I can't go back into the object sounds, seeing they're not there. We can run through the sounds in here. So they all ended up being made with algorithm. <laughs> And get a little distorty. But it's very simple sound. Obviously going through the reverb space. I set the reverb space relatively early when I was building the original piece and decided not to change it. But there's no reason not to. Obviously if I'm taking a cover or starting from scratch, then I would throw out the reverb and start completely fresh. But I didn't want to do that, I wanted to keep a fair amount the same. So I've made a sound, yes, that expresses the playing. We've got to take into account things like velocity and how to make the piece work. And that teaches us a lot. You know, we can learn, ah, that's what, that's what this composer was doing, that's what they were thinking when they did this. That's the, the first one, the second sound, and these are in the order in which they were made, largely. This sounds quite different from the original one. The original one's a breathy, airy sort of pad. I thought about trying to make this more that way, but I liked this sound. It sounded good. Again, notice how simple it is. It's about the music doing the job, not about the patch. Oh, this is that cello-y sort of sound. 
Adams has a more of a Wendy Carlos switched on Bach kind of feel. But if I recall correctly, the original object sound was a little bizarre in the first place. It was like a, um, a, a bass flute or something like that. It was a bit strange, but combined with that funny failed string sound for that first section just gave this really great cello sound. The drum... Obviously sounds different from the object one, but it works. The concept is to make it sound good within the piece, not to say here's the perfect drum sound. Because if we make that mistake, so here's... That's it within the piece. That's the original. So it's actually bigger. It's got a slightly more metallic sound. I will test how I feel about that once that goes up, up in the lounge room. But here, even in cans, I'm pleased with how that sounds. There was this um, sort of strange clavichord sound. Which I rendered more as a guitar-y type sound this time. I did brighten it up so it sounds a little less like a guitar now. But there's a lot about that that's really rather cool. So using Scream, we warm that up so that it becomes less like. A... But if we wanted that really hard digital sound, that sort of pin sharp. DX70 sound, but putting it through Scream changes that. Our trumpet sound. So it sounds more trumpety than the original, which is fine by me. It does have a very, as I say, DX7 analogy brass sort of thing. And I know that there is a conflict between DX7 and analog, but there is DX7 brass sounds that we think are analog, but they're actually DX7. There, there are um, few tracks that use them, and they sound superb. Um, I'm pretty confident that um, uh, Elton John's Nikita, uh, the they, the really lovely horn sound in there. I think that's a DX7. I could be wrong, but it, it's consistent with that. Uh, and while time-wise, it probably isn't uh, Human League's Louise. Uh, is, is kind of similar. I'm not sure what um, what Phil was using at the time. It really doesn't matter, but there's a, that sort of beautiful sound. A little bit of effort goes into making these, the movement and what have you. And again, Scream just gives us a bit of... a, a nicer sense of feel and, and cut in the mix. Our string. Actually, I hadn't played this outside of the mix, so I have no idea what it sounds like as a... That's really nice. i got to say, I've got to have to remember how that was done. Because I probably wouldn't have made that sound that way. If I had just made the sand on its own, I would have made something bigger and stodgier and all kinds of stuff, but that's why we get that nice sort of Yeah, that's 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 a good sound. I'm pleased with that. Uh, and then this one, which was and because object has this little step sequencer then we were able to give something that the average listener probably wouldn't notice a big difference of giving it that speckly sound. I could have used any synth. I considered just using whatever synth came to mind as I reached and I thought, no, nah, no, nah, I'll just make it all algorithm because I knew that algorithm was likely to give me very nice, reasonably compatible sorts of sounds, even though I was never looking to say they have to sound the same, but some I wanted more of the same, like this one. I wanted that speckly thing. Europa could have done some or all of this as well, but I do really like algorithm. It's a way of getting some very interesting sounds 
um, that are unexpected. Uh, and, and Europa is capable of doing that too, but I tend to use Europa more when I can hear what I want and I go, that's how I'm going to make that. Whereas algorithm, I'm a little bit more like, yeah. And I'll just add things and go, what is this adding? Over time, obviously, I will get much more used to the the boxes and what what's likely to come out of them. But algorithm is a newish synth for me compared to, say, Thor, um, which uh, he, the chances of me getting unknown sounds out of that are relatively slim. But that doesn't make Thor boring for me. That makes Thor incredibly reliable for me. There's our sound set. That's, that's it. Um, I just changed some of this because I, I used only reason things for the reason competition entry, seeing that seemed the kindest, fairest, most positivist um, reason approach. Uh, yeah, that's, that's basically it. So from here... And a revoice. The revoice happens to be algorithm, but it could have been anything. I could have done all this with subtractor, or I could have revoiced just using um, NN19, uh, whatever. Uh, again, if you're going to revoice, my advice very strongly is do not use samples. If you go, oh, well, that's a, uh, say, a flute sand here, you don't go through a sand bank going, I'm looking for flute sands. You just go, okay, how can I honour that sand and have it do what it needs to do, which is not, thou shalt sand exactly like flute, but to find how to make it move nicely, and to move nicely not only within its line, but within the piece, and you do that out of simple synthesis, and by putting little bits of detail into that synthesis, which of course algorithm is superb for, um, then you come out with your own result, and you most likely have learned a thing or twelve by the time you've done this, a time or two, uh, it really speeds things along, especially if you're working on somebody else's piece or even working on your own to be able to say, I'm just going to revoice this and I'm going to turn it into something else without pulling out beat choppers because that's, that's not really revoicing, it's just hacking. Um, and that's been the problem with the remix culture to say, oh, we'll just hack and destroy and pretend that the choppity, choppity, choppity has actually made it better when what makes something great is actually the melody, the progression of how they move things. I hope that's been of interest to somebody. If you have any questions, obviously ask on down below. If you're interested in hiring me, whether it's to revoice something or to help you learn how to do this kind of stuff, again, down below, probably after having gone onto my website and, and fill in the form. But if you don't like filling in forms, then contact me via Facebook Messenger. But I'm still going to ask you questions to actually understand what needs to be done. And if you kind of don't want to answer that, show me who you are, what you've done, what needs to be done, what your budget is for this, because I can't work for free, because free doesn't actually turn into carrots that I can feed to the children, um, then we're still going to end up in the same place. Most importantly, get out there, try this. If you do go and revoice as, as a result of having watched this, then please link it down below. And that way we can all share in the, the gains that we can all have from this. You have a great day now.